and in this video we're going to take a further look into the deaths of the Essex boys and in particular Patrick Tate. In this video we're going to hear from a police informant who passed on information regarding the murders shortly after their deaths. We'll also hear from a statement given by Pat Tate's then neighbour and lastly, we're going to look at a newspaper article which discusses the last person who spoke to Pat Tate who has yet to be questioned by police. The following police printout comes from the 8th of December 1995, where it states the following. Action number A305 from Registered Informant. The man who shot Tate is called Wiseman and is known to Potter's Bar. He was shot over a cocaine deal. Update to follow. Okay, now the first thing that I pick up on when reading this particular police printout, and I think it's important to remember before we go into this, that by the very nature of these documents, these particular documents, they are quite short, so they do lack a lot of detail and information in a lot of ways. But the first thing that I pick up on, even reading such a short document like this one, is the talk of a deal and the potential of Tate being the target that evening. So at this point, where do we go from here with this information? Well, I've gone back and taken a look at some of the statements from people who saw Tate, who spoke to Tate on the very day that he was killed. What was his attitude like? What was he discussing? What was he talking about? And one of the ones that I remember quite vividly is the statement from Barry Dorman. It's in his statement that he talks about Pat Tate purchasing a vehicle from him. He was going to purchase a vehicle, then he decided he didn't need it anymore, but he would still purchase it because he was coming in to a large sum of money. This talk of imminent financial gain, if you will. So let's take a look at that statement, or at least a section of that statement, from Pat Tate's friend Barry Dorman. The following section of this police statement is given by Barry Dorman on the 8th of December 1995. During the morning of Wednesday the 6th of December 1995, I was at the car front when Pat, Tony, Craig and Mr P Cuthbert arrived in the Range Rover. I would describe Cuthbert as male, white, 5'10 to 5'11, late 30s, reasonably fit build. I've been told he is a ceiling fixer. The four of them came into the office and I was handed by one of them the paying in book relating to the Range Rover finance and between them they produced £321.40 in cash. I was asked by one of them, I can't remember who, to keep the book and remind them when the payments were due. I agreed to do this as it was in my interest to make sure the finance was paid. I'd also been told by Pat and Tony at the time of purchasing the vehicle that they intended to pay it off in one lump fairly quickly. Right, so I'll just cut in here. Now, this is the first sort of inkling, I guess, that there may be money coming in the pipeline. This talk that they could pay this vehicle off in one lump sum. We'll continue on as there is another part to this which does also back up this theory. I paid this sum into the Barclays Bank at Pitsy Broadway the following day. I can produce the paying in book as my exhibit BDT slash 4. Sometime during an earlier meet with Pat, he had asked me whether I had a suitable vehicle for him to give Sarah Saunders. He told me there had been a lot of problems between them and he wanted to give her a car to get her off his back. I told him I had a VW Passat on the forecourt, which I had taken in as part exchange on the 25th of the 11th, 95. I showed him the vehicle, which was metallic green in colour and had the registration number F120GGF. He agreed to take it for a test drive and we later agreed on a price of £1,800 for the vehicle. I can produce a purchase invoice for this VW Passat as my exhibit BDT-5. I left my garage forecourt around 5 to 5.30pm on Wednesday the 6th of December 95, intending to play my friend Keith Moore at Squash. At this time my daughter Susan and an employee Mickey Stenning were at the car front. En route to Squash, I received a phone call from Mickey Stenning stating that Herc, which is my pet name for Pat Tate, i.e. short for Hercules due to his size, had arrived at the car front to collect the VW Passat. Pat then came onto the phone and told me he would still take the vehicle even though he didn't need it, as he had had a bust up with Sarah Saunders. I told him that he didn't need to take it, but he insisted that he would. 
he told me that he would pay for the vehicle in the morning as he had a lump of money coming. As a result, I agreed to Pat taking the vehicle that night, which he did. So it's very clear to me, at least, when reading this statement, that Tate believed he was coming into some kind of money. And we're not talking about in the next week. We're not talking about in the next month. He's even willing to take a car, an £1,800 car, when he doesn't actually even need the vehicle. In his words, he is coming in to a large sum of money. He would pay for the vehicle the next morning, which would have been the 7th of December, the day that the bodies of Tucker, Tate and Rolf were actually discovered. He would pay for the vehicle in the morning as he had a lump of money coming. Was this because there was some sort of deal about to take place? Some kind of deal in the pipeline? Now, a lot of people actually don't subscribe to that belief that there was a deal because these individuals were most likely unarmed. Now, in Barry Dorman's statement, there is another piece of information which I find quite telling. It's where he states the following. The Range Rover was taken by Pat and Tony on the 14th of November, 95. From that day, when Pat, Tony and Craig visited my car front, they would be using the Range Rover. Craig would normally be the driver, with Pat in the front passenger seat and Tony in the back. Now this goes against how these bodies were found, quite naturally, with Tate in the back seat, Tucker in the front seat. So the first thing that flashes through my mind when visualising what is being spoken about in this statement here, the fact that Tate would normally be in the front seat and Tucker in the back. This is telling me personally that the person in the back of the Range Rover was someone potentially known to Tate. And I guess really that goes alongside the official version of events in terms of Michael Steele being closest to Pat Tate. Does that mean necessarily that it was Michael still in the back of the Range Rover? No, of course not. But the fact that this seating arrangement has apparently changed from what is considered the norm, at least to Barry Dorman, tells me that that was someone who knew Pat Tate. It was at least someone who was potentially closer to Pat Tate than the other two individuals. It could also be explained simply by saying that Tate was the last one to be collected. So naturally, the second person to be picked up would have been Tony Tucker. He would have quite naturally got into the front of that Range Rover. Tate being the last person to be picked up would have hopped in the back. I mean, it could be explained in those terms also. Now, when we take a look back at Donna Jagger's statement, uh, a paragraph of her statement, Donna Jagger's being the girlfriend of Craig Rolfe, the driver of the Range Rover, It's when she is discussing the events concerning December the 6th that she mentions the following. Craig wanted me to have something new to wear for the evening and took me to Lakeside Shopping Centre at 5.45pm. He was driving the Range Rover and left me to go and pick Tony Tucker up. Craig told me that he was going because he didn't want Tony to be in a position to say he hadn't had any part in the arranging. I also understood that Craig was going to collect Tony Tucker from his house and then they were going to meet Tate and Steele later. Now, as a side note, this could go to explain what I've just spoken about there. The fact that Tate was in the back seat and not in the front as he was usually. So that could go to explain the seating arrangements for December the 6th in terms of the Range Rover. But what I find, I guess, most fascinating there about that statement or that section of the statement is the fact that there's talk here of there being a meeting later with Steele and Tate. And this is also kind of backed up in a way by the statement of Darren Nichols, where he talks about being with Steele, Steele telling him that he's going to meet Pat for a deal. This is almost reflected in the statement here by Donna Jaggers, that Rolf is going to pick up Tucker, and they're going to meet with Tate and Steele later. I mean, realistically, we don't even know if there ever was a fourth passenger in the Range Rover. I think oftentimes we get swayed and stuck on, maybe not intentionally, but we get stuck on the version put forward by Darren Nichols. And I think that's because that is the most commonly told version of events, the fact that Michael Steele was in the Range Rover. But you can choose to discredit all of Darren Nichols' evidence if you so desire, which really does open up a lot of different possibilities in terms of how Tucker, Tate and Rolf were killed. 
What I find particularly intriguing about this piece of information from this police informant is that this information came through just 24 hours after Tucker, Tate and Rolf were found dead. This information came through on the 8th of December 1995 from a registered police informant. Which ultimately leaves us with the question, was this some kind of deal? Did Tate expect to come into some kind of money? Maybe this wasn't even a robbery. Maybe it was a robbery. Maybe it was a double cross. The possibilities here are endless. And I think that's what is quite, as I say, intriguing about this piece is that it allows for scope. It allows for different possibilities, different angles to be looked at in a more open way. There is one thing, however, that I believe most of us can agree on, and that is Tucker, Tate and Rolf during this time period most certainly felt as if they were on the up, that their luck had changed, that there was a great deal of money coming in the pipeline. But what exactly did that entail? Was it a straightforward deal? Was it a double cross? Was it a robbery that went tragically wrong for Tucker, Tate and Rolf? And ultimately, did this end up costing them their lives. The following statement is from Jason Hassel. The bungalow next door to ours is number 49 and this was occupied by a woman called Sarah who has a young child. I only really knew her to say hello to and she lives there alone. Around four weeks ago a male person moved in and I took him to be Sarah's new boyfriend. I would describe him as white aged in his early 30s. He was over six feet tall with a very heavy build. He had short black hair and spoke with a local accent. I only ever spoke to him once when his burglar alarm was ringing. Since he moved in, the number of visitors has increased. I can recall seeing many different types of motor cars which are as follows. A 928 Porsche, color black. Red Volkswagen GTI, no later than an f -reg. Black Sea Reg Ford Fiesta XR2, Black Volkswagen Polo, Green Volkswagen Passat, White Ford Orion, and a Green Range Rover. Most of these vehicles were there at night. Sarah's car was a light coloured Renault 5. The most frequent visitor was a male person who I now know to be Tucker, who drove the Green Range Rover. I recognised Tucker and my neighbour described above as Tate from photographs I saw in national newspapers covering the murders of the three men in a Range Rover at Rettenden. Around 5.30pm on the 6th of December, I was in the back garden of our bungalow when I heard a motor vehicle horn being sounded at the front of the bungalow. I thought it was my mum arriving home from work, as she usually does at this time. I thought it was her sounding the horn because my car was blocking the drive. I walked inside to my dad's office, which is at the front. I looked out of the window and saw a Range Rover turning around in front of our bungalow. It was a light coloured one. I don't believe it was the same one that Tucker used. I could not see how many people were in it. I could not see my mum's car. The Range Rover stopped in the road outside number 49. I then heard the front door of number 49 slam shut. A few seconds later, I heard the sound of a car door being shut. I took this to be the door of the Range Rover. As I walked away, I heard the Range Rover rev up and drive off towards Timberlog Lane. I recalled a wheel spinning on the ice and snow. I went into the kitchen and carried on with what I was doing. I am willing to attend court if required. Okay, now a lot of you hearing that will immediately think that this solves the riddle of the green Range Rover. Well, quite simply, it does not. If you think about this logically, Tucker may well have owned a green Range Rover at some point in time, but he went out of his way to purchase a blue one for Craig to use to ferry Tucker and Tate around. What would be the need to purchase the blue Range Rover if Tucker still had the use of the green one? I believe he'd either sold it or it was off the road during this time. What else can we take from this eyewitness account? Well, according to the person who was looking through the window, according to the neighbour here, this wasn't the common Range Rover which used to pull up outside Pat Tate's house. This was a different one. Now, do bear in mind this person is looking through a window. 
he is looking into the darkness it's potentially snowy or drizzly outside and the Range Rover may have been parked underneath a street lamp we've already seen pictures of the green and black Range Rover and how they can look so similar especially with the light turned down slightly so this person's visibility would have been restricted to some degree and when he looks outside into the uh, darkness and sees this Range Rover it may actually have appeared a lighter color than what it actually was especially if it was parked as I say underneath a street lamp could this have been the green Range Rover could this have been the normal blue Range Rover the problem we have here is that this timeline does not match up with Donna Jagger's statement of her being dropped off at the lakeside shopping center so was this a different Range Rover collecting Pat Tate potentially the green one. Last man called by one of the murdered Essex boys was never questioned by police. Is the Essex boys killer still at large? An ex-detective claims police ignored a shooter clue link in the infamous shotgun murders of Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe in 1995. The last man called by one of three gangsters murdered in the 1995 Essex Boys killings was never questioned by police. It has emerged. Retired detective David McKelvey says the suspected villain was linked to a man who has previously been named as the shooter but was never charged. Instead, Jack Wombs and Michael Steele were jailed for life after being convicted of blasting the drug dealers with a shotgun in their Range Rover 26 years ago. But Mr McKelvey and his team of highly experienced former murder detectives now claim to have found evidence supporting the account of an East End crook who told police he was the getaway driver for the real killer. Mr McKelvey, who runs private investigation firm TMI, said, quote, We have done a thorough and detailed investigation which has led us to believe there may have been a miscarriage of justice. Compelling new evidence throws the case into doubt and we are appealing for witnesses to come forward. The bodies of Pat Tate, 36, Tony Tucker, 38 and Craig Rolfe, 26 were found on a remote snow-covered farm track in Rettendon, Essex on December 7th, 1995. According to the prosecution, they were shot dead the night before between 6.48 and 6.59 p.m. The final call made from Tate's mobile, apart from one to a girlfriend, was at 18.26 and lasted 17 seconds. It was never disclosed at the trial. Mr McKelvey said the vital witness, Tate Rang, is repeatedly named in the police murder file as a person of interest. Days after the murders, an action was raised to interview him, but when his solicitor said he was refusing to talk, officers gave up. The papers reveal. Mr McKelvey said, quote, How can you not talk to him? He was the last person to speak to Pat Tate on the phone before he was executed around half an hour before it. We have requested a meeting with the Chief Constable of Essex on six occasions to ask him about our findings without success. As a result, we will be asking these questions in public. Mr McKelvey believes the evidence supports the account of East End criminal Billy Jasper, who gave Essex police a detailed account of how he was the getaway driver for a named assassin. Detectives made no inquiries into his story, file show. Mr McKelvey says he has seen intelligence which links the alleged shooter named by Jasper with the man called by Tate before he was shot. He said, quote, What we have established is the 1826 call was made to an individual who was connected to that man through an armed robbery in 1989. This was known to Essex police in 1995 and 1996, but they never formally interviewed these people about the murders. The convictions of Wombs, now 58, and Steele, 76, rested on the testimony of convicted fraudster Darren Nichols. Mr McKelvey, who arrested Nichols in connection with drug smuggling in 1996, had believed the pair were guilty. He plans to present his findings to the Criminal Cases Review Commission and Essex police. An Essex police spokesman said, quote, There was an exhaustive investigation and the evidence has been examined by the Criminal Cases Review Commission and the Court of Appeal. This case is under review of the CCRC and it would be inappropriate to comment further. The youngest of the three, cocaine addict and gopher Craig Rolfe, 26, was found slumped behind the wheel. He was suspected of murdering a rival drug dealer by giving him a lethal injection just days earlier. 
Behind Rolf in the Range Rover was the body of 18 Stone Pat Tate, who was the gang's enforcer and had a long history of violence. The night before his death, the 36-year-old steroid abuser attacked a restaurant manager slamming his head into a glass plate counter following a row over pizza toppings. He simply wanted cheese, you can't. Tate, who had been released from prison a few weeks before, was an associate of M25 road rage killer Kenneth Noy, who he had met in jail. The leader of the group, Tony Tucker, 38, was a doorman who controlled the drugs trade in a number of Essex nightclubs. Pat Tate met Mick Steele, a known drug importer, and Jack Wombs, a car mechanic and insurance fraudster, while in prison. The prisoners, who were all from Suffolk and Essex, kept in touch after their release. Tate, a bodybuilder, went on to become an enforcer for Tony Tucker, who was involved in the drugs trade in Essex nightclubs during the explosion of the rave scene in the late 80s. Informant Darren Nichols claimed Steele and Wombs had become angry because an earlier narcotics deal had gone wrong. He said this was their motive for luring their victims to the country lane on the pretext of discussing a cocaine shipment. Wombs, who was cleared for release from prison earlier this year, applied in 2019 to the Criminal Cases Review Commission to have his conviction overturned and the case is still being considered. His application is thought to include details of a Scotland Yard bugging operation that recorded a gangster offering to take out the dealers who supplied Leah Betts three weeks before they were murdered. Tucker, Tate and Rolfe controlled a supply of ecstasy in the Basildon Club where the tablet was bought. Details of the bugging operation appear in a 2002 Scotland Yard draft intelligence report called Operation Tiberius, which claimed gangsters had infiltrated the Met at will. The Mirror revealed in 2017 details of the gangsters' proposition to a retired detective then suspected of corruption. An extract in the report states, on the 16th of November 1995, ex-officer met with criminal associate who offered the hand of friendship by offering to take out the supplier of the drugs to Leah Betts, who died of an overdose. The Tiberius report also names Jasper and says he was shot in a non-fatal attack, though it does not say when. Billy Jasper was arrested for armed robbery a month after the murders on January the 15th, 1996. He claimed another criminal, Jesse Gale, who later died in a car crash, gave him £5,000 to drive an accomplice known as Mr D to and from Rettenden, Essex. He says Mr D was going to do a cocaine deal with the three men. Jasper testified at the Old Bailey murder trial that he had agreed to the plan and later spotted Mr D's 9mm Browning pistol and sawn off shotgun when he drove him to the murder scene at Workhouse Lane but Jasper did not fit with Essex Police's theories. The Essex Police log noted January the 18th, 1996, that the account did not fit with the current intelligence, direction and evidence already available. Four months later, Darren Nichols told police he was the real getaway driver, but David McKelvey said it was a blinkered investigation. Darren Nichols made his confession after police stopped him in a car that had cannabis worth £10,000 in the boot. Such was the significance of his testimony that while summing up at the Old Bailey trial, Mr Justice Hidden told the jury, quote, I hardly need to stress the importance of Nichols' evidence. So much hinges on what he said. At the time, neither judge nor jury knew that Nichols had agreed to a commercial arrangement, with a writer to publish Blogs 19, a book about the killings which made Nichols several thousand pounds. He remains in hiding after being given a new identity. Okay, so the real point of interest in this article is this telephone call, the 17 second phone call at 6.26pm. Now clearly the phone schedules that we have, that we've looked over over the last two years, are not complete. It would appear that reading this article that even the defence didn't know about this 17 second phone call. There appears to be this phone call here, 17 seconds in duration at 6.26, to an unknown person made by Pat Tate. Now what is interesting to me personally about this 17 second phone call is how it can relate to the phone call from Sarah Saunders. Now we know, according to her police statement, that during the phone call between her and Pat Tate, he says to her, look, I can't speak at the moment, I'm with some people, I'll see you tomorrow, don't worry, everything's fine, um, I'll see you tomorrow. The phone call ends and then he is later killed. Now what Sarah Saunders 
found strange about that phone call is the fact that he mentioned he was with some people. She said if he was with Nick Steele or someone that she knew, he would have just said, I'm with Mick and the boys at the moment. I'll see you tomorrow. Can't really speak at the moment. But that's not actually what he said. He said, I'm with some people. I'll see you tomorrow. Now, the fact that this phone call from Pat Tate to this unknown person lasts 17 seconds, could that indicate that that phone call was about Tate saying to this unknown individual, yep, I'm down the lane, I'm down Workhouse Lane, we're waiting for you, that sort of thing. 17 seconds is quite a short duration. Could it also lend a little bit more credibility to the fact that the Range Rover may have been waiting at the locked five bar gate for a period of time as put forward by the defence? We remember the soot deposits underneath the exhaust, which gave the indication, at least from the defence's point of view, that the Range Rover had been parked there for some length of time with the engine running. We know that when the Range Rover was discovered by the farmers, the ignition was switched to off. So you can only imagine that this was done by the perpetrator or perpetrators of this crime. So could they have been waiting down the lane? Tate makes this 17 second phone call, says, we're down the lane, where are you? We're waiting for you. Um, how long are you going to be? We're down Workhouse Lane. Ends the call. Saunders then calls. This guy has actually arrived, potentially even in the back of the Range Rover at this point. And then Tate says to her, I can't talk now, I'm with some people. That would explain the Range Rover being there with the engine running for a period of time. Tate making this short phone call to see where this person is, how long he's going to be, giving him possibly directions to where they are. And then Saunders ringing up and this guy having arrived in the Range Rover. What is worthy of mention, and something I must stress, is that we don't actually know Pat Tate's position when he made this phone call. We don't have any cell data to show, you know, rough proximity of where he was situated when this 17 second phone call took place. And interestingly, we don't actually have any mention of this phone call from Darren Nichols. If Steele was in the Range Rover with Tucker, Tate and Rolf and this 17 second phone call took place, then why did Steele not mention it to Nichols after the event? Considering he mentioned supposedly the phone call between Saunders and Tate, why did he not mention the phone call at 1826? He would have been in the Range Rover during this time period, yet this phone call is not mentioned. Interestingly, this phone call is actually omitted from the telephone bundle. I don't believe the defence even knew during the trial that this phone call even took place. Realistically, we can't even say with any great deal of certainty that the Range Rover was even down Workhouse Lane at 1826. As I say, because we don't have this cell site data for Tate's mobile to say, you know, a rough proximity of where he was during this time period, 1826, it's really hard to say where the Range Rover was located when Tate made this call.